So um, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Tejendra Ferrali. Uh, I'm an associate professor in education and international development um, at the Center for Education and International Development at UCL Institute of Education. Um, this event is organized by the center as part of our annual seminar series uh, on education in conflict and emergencies. My colleague, uh, Dr. May Abu Mugli and I are delighted to welcome you to this webinar in solidarity with the struggle of Palestinian scholars, educational practitioners and students who have been experiencing brutal violence in the last um, few weeks. It is heartbreaking to see an alarming escalation in violence directed against them. As we know, these events are part of disposition and oppression of Palestinians, um, which has been ongoing for several decades. Israel's latest war has caused acutely distressing harms on Palestinian educational institutions, and many students, including young children, have been killed. Many of us um, have families, friends, and close relatives who live in Palestine. And some of you, including some of our speakers today, um, live in Palestine. So we've organized this webinar particularly um, to, um, to, to show our solidarity and, and also um, to create a sense of uh, debate and, and um, uh, support uh, for those who have uh, struggled to live their life with dignity, uh, have fought for right to learn and have freedom in life. In this spirit of solidarity, we are here today um, to, to discuss some of the um, issues that education is experiencing in, in Palestine. So we have a fantastic panel of speakers today who will make some remarks at the beginning, um, and we will open up for Q&A at the end. Uh, now I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Maya Bumugli, um, to say a few words uh, and introduce the speakers. Thank you very much, Tajendra. Um, I'm just going to say uh, a few words and then uh, move to introductions, uh, if technology allows me. OK, so um, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. I'm very delighted to have so many people participating in such an important um, webinar. So thank you for joining us, uh, us today. Um, and. Uh, as Tajendra said, we're bringing together four leading engaged academics working in and on Palestine. So we're honored and privileged to have them with us um, talking about the issue of education in Palestine and for Palestinians. Education um, is a core and fundamental foundational aspect of the struggle for liberation, not only in Palestine, but globally, particularly amongst nations and groups who continue to raise their voices and break all barriers to achieve justice, equality, and emancipation. In our webinar today, we will be shedding light on the violations committed by the Israeli settler colonialism against Palestinian education, attacks against education institutions, the very content of our curriculum in schools and universities, attacks against scholars, academics, as well as students. But also we are shedding light on the role of education, the role of educators and students in the journey to liberation. We want to show solidarity between and amongst all who share these struggles that can come together to lead us to maintain our hope and allow for an imaginary for a better and more just future. Um, as I mentioned before, we have four brilliant speakers today. Unfortunately, two of them could not be with us, but they shared their amazing presentations. So I'll introduce our speakers briefly. So our first speaker uh, is Dr. Haider Dr. Eid. Uh, he's um, going to be, he, he shared a video uh, from the besieged and occupied Gaza Strip. Haider was unable to be with us today due to electricity cuts as a result of the Israeli attacks and ongoing siege. Dr. Eid is an associate professor of post-colonial and post-modern literature at Al-Aqsa University in Gaza. Haider has many publications, including his book, Worlding Postmodernism, Interpretive uh, Possibilities of Critical Theory. I encourage you to, to check his publications. 
Our second speaker is Dr. Jamila Shannan. Dr. Shannan, in addition to being my ultimate and absolute inspiration, is a scholar, an educator, an activist, and a public speaker dedicated to socioeconomic and political justice. Her work examines how matrices of oppression and liberation operate in the context of settler colonialism and anti-Black racism. Jamila's work also focuses on schools as she interrogates the role of teachers and students in cultivating their political clarity to engage in liberation work towards justice. After way too many years in exile, Jamila is finally back home in Palestine. Our third speaker is from Palestine, Haifa in particular. Dr. Ayman Ghbariye is a researcher, poet, playwright, and activist. His areas of expertise include education amongst ethnic and religious minorities, policy and pedagogy for civics education, Islamic education, and teacher training. Ayman's poems have been published in many anthologies in various languages, and four of his plays have been produced. Dr. Ghbariye is chair of the research committee at Madal Karmel Haifa. Dr. Ghbariye is actually affiliated with UCL, a fact that I did not know before our communication for this webinar. But I'm very excited that he's part of the UCL family, and I hope that this webinar will be a foundation for our future work uh, with our Center uh, for, uh, for Education and International Development at the Institute of Education. Last but not, not least, our final speaker, who's a dear friend, um, who could not be with us today, uh, Professor Mario Novelli. He's uh, based at the University of Sussex. Professor Novelli, uh, his work engages with political economy of education, drawing on the tools of critical political economy. His work explores the relationship between education systems and armed conflict, the relationship between education and processes of globalization, learning and knowledge production in trade unions, social movements, and civil society organizations. Mario's presentation today will tell us more about solidarity and the important, importance of joint struggles. We will start with the four presentations. Each speaker will, will, will talk for 10 to 15 minutes. Aside from Haydar, we gave him a little bit more time. Then we will open the floor for comments and questions. Uh, I encourage the participants in this webinar to write their questions and comments in the chat box during the presentation. Um, and we hope to get uh, to as many questions and comments as possible. So please do also uh, let us know if your question and comment is directed to one particular speaker that will make things easier for us. One more, one more thing before I stop talking. This webinar, as Tejendra said, will be, is re being recorded. It will be available later on. And uh, we'll also ensure that the final copy includes Arabic subtitles for our colleagues in Palestine and in other Arabic speaking countries and spaces so it can be used as an educational resource. So without further ado, I'll play uh, Dr. Haider Eid's video. Unfortunately, I had to take the liberty to make some cuts to his presentation, because unfortunately we have limited times, but I assure you we'll share the full recording uh, with, a final, uh, with a final recording of this whole webinar. Um, so my colleague Nadal, if you can please share the video, that would be great. Thank and you. all, you know, as teachers, as university professors, and and uh, you know, as as students, we need to put that within a context. The context of uh, context of what has been happening happening to us um, here in Gaza, and only two days ago, uh, a ceasefire was declared by apartheid Israel after attacking Gaza for eleven days, killing. <laughs> excuse me, more than 245 civilians, including 64 children and 39 women. 64 children who go to school, primary school, prep school, et cetera, including university students, some of whom are our students at Al-Aqsa University. Um, and this, you know, in, in, the last, in the last 11 years, apartheid Israel has launched um, four massive, um, and I would call them genocidal wars, 
of aggression on, on the occupied Gaza, Gaza Strip. Um, and many of our civilians, including our students, were massacred, uh, including some of my, you know, favorite students. I mean, one of them was a fantastic lady, uh, Ma'athir Abu Znaid, who was killed in, um, in, in the two, 2009 massacre. One of my brightest students and some other students as well, including um, uh, Hibal Halaq uh, and some other students as well. So, uh, you know, this, this comes as a result of, um, you know, Israel's indiscriminate bombing, which, uh, you know, which, um, which has been condemned by United Nations, UN experts and leading human rights organizations, including, um, including, by the way, Israel's main, main mainstream human rights organizations, such as um, Bet Salem. Uh, you know, they were described as war crimes and crimes against humanity. And these assaults, as I said, in the latest attack, which came to an end only two days ago, you know, and I don't like to talk about figures because every single person killed by apartheid trail has a family, has kids, has parents, um, has, you know, a wife, children, etc, etc. And I don't like to talk about, you know, figures, you know, in 2000, 2009, 1,200 people got killed in 2014, more than 2000. Now we are talking about, you know, human beings. I'm talking about my own students. I'm talking about children. You know, the worst part, the worst part, of those massacres, especially, especially the one that came to an end two days ago, the worst part was targeting children. And you know, people cannot fathom that. Um, but it is the result of an ideology that dehumanizes native Palestinians. Uh, so the overwhelming majority of those who got killed, get killed um, um, you know, are civilians. And, you know, we, we the two million Palestinians uh, living in, uh, in, in, in the besieged Gaza Strip, the overwhelming majority of us, by the way, are refugees who were violently expelled and dispossessed from our homes by Zionist militias in 1948, as everybody knows. <laughs> You know, in 2009, we were subjected to three weeks of, you know, um, um, of um, a genocidal onslaught. In 2012, for two weeks. In 2014, for 51 days. And, you know, this month for 11 days. And, you know, relentless Israeli state terror, whereby Israeli war planes systematically targeted civilian areas, including schools, including universities, reduced whole neighborhoods and vital civilian infrastructure to rubble, like what happened, you know, uh, in Rimal, where I live, with the street massacre. And they destroyed scores of schools, including several run by United Nations, UNRWA, United Nations and Relief Work Agency, where civilians, uh, you know, were taking shelter, for example. At the moment, there are still 60,000 people taking shelter in, in, in schools. So, um, but the point is that all these massacres, those onslaughts, uh, uh, come after years of an ongoing, crippling, deadly, medieval Israeli siege of Gaza. You know, I'm recording this for you using a generator right like now. I haven't seen electricity for three, day, for three days, by the way. So you can imagine the impact of that on my students. And we are approaching the end of our semester. And they are supposed to be, uh, you know, studying two novels, for example, this semester. I don't know how they're going to do that. And because of the coronavirus, we have been teaching, we have been, I have been teaching them online, which makes it worse even, even and more difficult. And, and this deadly siege imposed by apartheid Israel, as you know, is 
I mean, let's call a spade a spade, is a severe form of collective punishment. Severe form of collective punishment. For example, um, the International Committee of, uh, of the Red Cross, ICRC, <laughs> made it absolutely clear that, you know, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase in a way that, you know, Gaza civilian population is being punished for acts for which we Palestinians of Gaza, Gaza bear no responsibility. Why are we being punished? I mean, honestly, why? Only because we, we represent, we are the indigenous population actually of, of, of Palestine, exactly like the way the indigenous population of South Africa was being punished or was punished by the apartheid system of South Africa in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, and therefore, this closure, this blockade, according to the, to the ICRC, again, constitutes a form of collective pun punishment and comes in clear violation of Israel's obligations under international humanitarian law. That is what the, the Red Cross had to say. And it also stated that Israel's blockade of the Gaza Strip constitutes a violation of international humanitarian law embodied in the Geneva, um, uh, in the Geneva, Con uh, the Geneva Conventions. And let me remind everybody here that, you know, the Fort Geneva Convention of 1949, ratified by Israel itself, bans collective punishment of a civilian population. Now, that is important for us to understand the crimes committed, um, being at the moment committed by apartheid Israel against us, the Palestinians of Gaza, including my own students. So in addition to Israel's daily um, attacks and airstrikes, we suffer from the contamination of water, contamination of air and soil, and since the sewage system is unable to function due to power cuts necessitated uh, by lack of fuel to the main generator of the Gaza power grid, so we have no electricity, we have no clean water. 97% of Gaza's reservoir water is undrinkable, polluted. And medical conditions due to injuries and, you know, because of these, you know, wars and, you know, onslaughts in Gaza. And these were, uh, and these injuries are or result from internationally prohibited, uh, you know, um, weapons, uh, illegal weapons, as well, of course, as well as from uh, water contamination. Uh, so these injuries cannot be treated because of the siege. And many of my students died because of that. So in addition, in addition to the ban on uh, you know, you know the siege. Since 2007, we have been living under this hermetic medieval siege. So, in addition to the ban on building materials, for example, Israel also prevents many other necessities from being important. In Gaza, we, we really wonder whether, you know, the current Israeli government, which is the most fascist, government in the history of the state of Israel, uh, whether this government might, ev might even discuss a ban on oxygen. I mean, that's the only thing left for apartheid Israel to do, in fact. And, um, and, and this, is, this is making life almost impossible for, uh, you know, my students. I haven't seen my students online now for more than three weeks because of the latest because of the latest attack. Add to that the fact that the Rafah crossing, which is the only exit uh, Gaza has to the external world, has been also been closed by the Egyptian regime. So in fact, the conclusion we have reached is that Israel is intent on destroying Gaza because world official bodies and leaders 
choose to say and do absolutely nothing. And that is the conclusion I have reached with my students. I mean, I teach them also Palestinian literature, the works of uh, the Palestinian, renowned Palestinian writer, the late uh, Ghassan Kanathani. I also teach them parts of the works of um, Edward Said. And we always have to deal with this question. I mean, for how long? Why did the world intervene in the case of South Africa in the 70s and 80s, boycotted the apartheid system of South Africa, including its academic institutions, due to their complicity in apartheid crimes uh, against the indigenous population of South Africa? We also here in Palestine, as academics, we issued um, you know, um, an, an, a call an, for academic and cultural boycott of apartheid Israel, of academic and cultural institutions in Israel due to their complicity in apartheid, in apartheid Israel's oppression of the Palestinian people. Um, and you know, Israel always refuses to cooperate with the international community to investigate crimes committed in, uh, in Palestine, in general, in Gaza in particular. And, 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 and I honestly think that, you know, this uh, practice of wanton killing or, or wanton willful killing of civilians, uh, of course, exemplified in the extrajudicial sniping of nonviolent protesters and, you know, attacks by American made F-16s and the support, military support, apartheid Israel is getting from the government of the United Kingdom as well. And, uh, and I think, you know, all this policy by apartheid Israel is part and parcel of an ongoing comprehensive policy targeting, you know, the civilian Palestinians of the Gaza Strip and systematically denying, uh, you know, them, uh, you know, their rights of movement, right to education, work, study, medical care, livelihood, and increasingly life itself. I mean, I have survived four massacres. Last week, last week, I mean, we couldn't sleep actually, not for a week, for 11 days. And they would choose to attack at either 1 or 2 a.m. and continue their attacks until, you know, the morning. Uh, the Wahda Street Massacre, where many students were killed, by the way. And I can't tell you stories and stories. And, you know, I think it is important to understand that because the education system is, you know, part of, uh, you know, uh, part of society in general, and our students are paying a very, very heavy price. Um, Apartheid, I mean, look, I spent six to seven years in South Africa. I got my PhD degree from the University of Johannesburg. And I, I, I started studying there in 1997, and that was three years after the election of Nelson Mandela as the first black president of multiracial, multicultural South Africa. And I had discussions with, you know, university professors, with students, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, um, you know, they told me about the Bantu, Bantu education in, in, in South Africa. And um, I studied the works of, you know, as well, Franz Fanon, uh, the Brazilian uh, philosopher and educated, educator, uh, Paulo Ferreri, uh, Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And one thing that I've ended up believing in is that uh, what needs to be done before even thinking about, you know, the idea of liberation in which we are involved right now, the first thing to do is to decolonize uh, our students' minds. And that is a very, very, very difficult process. In fact, we are talking about, you know, um, 73 years of uh, an ongoing Nakba, 
catastrophe. Israel uh, was established, of course, you know, the Nakba took place in 1948, the process of ethnic cleansing, which uh, uh, led to the, you know, ethnic cleansing of the overwhelming majority of Palestinians. And just to remind you, two thirds of the Palestinians of Gaza are refugees who were ethnically cleansed um, in 1948. The overwhelming majority of my students in Khan Yunis and in Gaza City itself are, uh, are from refugee uh, you know, families. So we have to discuss all these things. In addition to the you know, um, daily difficulties that they have, uh, it's trauma. I mean, I teach traumatized students. I am supposed to have an online meeting tomorrow with my students. And I know that the first thing that we are going to discuss is the latest, you know, uh, you know the last onslaught uh, launched by apartheid Israel. And I know, and I know that some of them will not be able to join my online class. So, um, and I'm very, very worried that they will tell me about, you know, uh, some of their peers who just died as a result of Israel's onslaught. I know some of our students were killed. Um, I haven't read the names. I haven't received, you know, a list of the names yet. I'm supposed to do that tomorrow. So that is the impact of Israel's policies um, against us here in the occupied territories in Palestine, historic Palestine in general, Palestinians, Palestinian, um, you know, uh, who live in Israel as second class citizens have to deal with Israel's apartheid policies there against them in the West Bank direct military occupation and Gaza. You know, Elan Pape, our friend and the courageous Israeli historian calls it, calls the siege of Gaza incremental genocide. Incremental, it is an incremental genocide. And this is what we have to deal with here. Thank you, Nidal. Thank you very much. Um, this is Haider. Unfortunately, I just texted him and he said that he doesn't have electricity. Um, so he won't be with us for the Q&A either, but he will try. Um, shall we move to Jamile? Thank you, my, thank you, Tejendra. Can you hear me, everybody? Yes. Um, it's heavy, it's heavy. I, um, uh, listening to Dr. Haydar, it's, uh, you know, uh, and I, I'm not, uh, I'm not going to add to that. I'm going to build on what Dr. Heda already offered. In, in a country like ours, for a people like ours, where a large percentage of our population are young people, whether children or youth, I mean, 30% of our population is between the ages of 15 and 29. So when we talk about genocide, when we talk about colonialism, we are actually talking, I mean, half the population is in one way or another related to schools. They're either um, children going to school, uh, young people in high school, or the older kids in university. Um, so it, it is impossible to talk about education without talking about um, the context. And it is also important to remember that when we talk about education, um, I'm gonna talk not only about schools, I'm going to talk about education in its broader sense and also what concerns knowledge production. How are we Palestinians creating and producing and internalizing our knowledge of ourselves and of the world in the context of colonialism that has produced apartheid amongst other systems? Apartheid, yes, good. Finally, some human rights organizations are catching up and calling it apartheid, but it's not all there is. There can be apartheid without colonialism. But in our case, the, the actual, the big picture, what's happening is a settler colonial uh, condition that produces apartheid as one of several strategies, all aiming at the same thing. The main goal of the Zionist state is the elimination of the native, eliminating us in many different ways, both physically, 
killing, murder, the massacres that we saw in, in Gaza. Also in the past two weeks, another 50 some Palestinians have been killed in the rest of Palestine, whether it is um, Jerusalem, Ramallah, Nablus, Khalil, uh, you know, here and there, and including what they themselves refer to as Israel, the Palestinian territories that have, were occupied, have been occupied since 1948. So, so there's, uh, and, and then there are murders and there are uh, targeted murders. Over the years, since I was a little kid, uh, there's also that form of killing. There's also the elimination of the native that happens in, the, in, this, in uh, another format, which is displacement. What we're witnessing currently in uh, Jerusalem with Sheikh Jarrah and Silwan, multiple neighborhoods in, in Silwan and Sheikh Jarrah, a neighborhood in Jerusalem, is another part of uh, the elimination of the native. Some people call it ethnic cleansing. I think that's too nice a word. Cleansing tends to be a nice word, and it's a word that uh, only people who think of human beings as dirt can imagine that removing us counts as cleansing. Um, it is, it is um, um, we need to come up with a different word for, for the moment. I, I call it displacement, uh, forced displacement. Uh, so it's another form of the elimination of the native. Another yet form of the elimination of the native is in our imagination, our own imagination of ourselves and how the world imagines us. So you, you look at the Zionist language, they refer uh, to, uh, uh, for example, lo look at how they refer to the people and the land. They refer to Palestinians who stayed in their land, even including some of them who were internally displaced as Arabs. They, they refuse to call them Palestinians. I, I mean, they are Palestinians. Um, there are probably other groups, but um, elimination of ourselves in our own imagination. We um, are constantly being told names of what we are, um, except being recognized as a Palestinian nation. In the 1993 Oslo agreements, the PLO recognizes the right of Israel to exist in return the Zionist state recognizes the PLO as representative of the Palestinians. So the elimination of the native happens both physically and symbolically. It also happens through um, uh, destruction of our buildings, of our institutions, of uh, what Dr. Heder was talking about. One of the things that I tend to focus on is look at, for example, how um, the, all the fight that we've been having throughout all the years over the curriculum. From the beginning of its establishment, the Zionist state took control over uh, the uh, formal education of Palestinians who remained in the land in 1947-48. Um, in 1967, it took control over the curricula, the school curricula for Palestinians in uh, the rest of Palestine, including Gaza Strip, what's known as the West Bank, which includes Jerusalem. And by extension, it also imposed um, censorship over the curriculum that the UN uses for Palestinian refugees in uh, Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan, practically, in reality, interfering in the um, curriculum that these countries use because the UN is supposed to follow the curriculum of the country where Palestinian refugees exist. So the Zionist state is trying to control the education of Palestinians wherever we are. It also exercises other forms of control over our education in exile. My experience in the US, and we probably have all heard of stories of Palestinian academics um, in the US and how our freedom of speech, of research, funding, um, everything is curtailed. Ultimately, the goal is to also control the knowledge produced by Palestinians and about Palestinians. And that is, this is very important to focus on. I am not saying that the murder of our youth is not important. Please do not misunderstand me. I am saying it is very, very important that we talk about the physicality of the elimination of the native. It is extremely important. And it is also important for us to realize that this is happening also at the discursive level, at the level of knowledge production and knowledge dissemination. So dare you, how dare you 
use a language that will actually reinforce our existence. Examples, a student um, in the United States gets their dissertation is told for two full years because the student refuses to refer to their army as Israeli defense forces, and the student insists to call them Israeli offense forces. And the student writes a beautiful, very articulate memo saying defense is a viewpoint. They call themselves defense. As a Palestinian, we call them offense. For two years, the student couldn't move forward. The compromise was to call them Israeli occupation forces because international law acknowledges them as occupation. So even at that level, when I was writing my dissertation, they weren't allowing me to use the word intifada in Arabic. This was like many, many years ago. Right now, the word intifada has entered um, the language. So when you look at those individual moments where they are uh, so insisting on something at the level of vocabulary, not even like discourse at its broad level, vocabulary. Um, this is connected to knowledge production, who we are in the world's imagination. So they refer to us as Palestinians. We are a Palestinian, we are a people. We are a people connected to a land, a land called Palestine. Look at how they refer to Gaza. There are children around the world that think that Gaza is something totally different from Palestine. They're asking me, what's the relationship between Gaza and Palestine? And some of us buy into it. Some of us end up talking about Gazans and Gaza. Gaza is Palestine. Jerusalem is Palestine. Im al Fahim is Palestine. This is Palestine. Now, if people want to accept that colonization happened and it's a de facto and we cannot undo the past, that's totally up to them. But do not colonize the past. Do not uh, distort the reality, the facts. The fact is that it is Palestine and we are a people and we are being displaced. The attack on um, um, on Palestinian education and the Palestinian people in general doesn't only happen at the hand of the uh, army. It's not only an, uh, bombs and killing and destruction. It is also happening at the hands of the cultural um, uh, agents of the Zionist state, whether it's their institutions, their universities, not only are doing research that actually helps manufacture the very same bombs within with which they are um, 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 killing us, but also the discourse, the language, and the research that helps the Zionist state position itself, sometimes a victim, sometimes a hero, sometimes a survivor, depends on the mood, right? So the minute they attack us, again, like they did lately, and uh, through social media, our youth did a wonderful, amazing job using social media to communicate directly with the world about what's going on, all of a sudden we are hit with anti-Semitism. So then the minute the ceasefire is announced, the next day, if you follow social media, there is a whole campaign around why do you hate Jews? And this is anti-Semitism. So this is, this is not a, a coincidence. This is, not, this is part and parcel of the settler colonial regime and that's why I keep insisting, although apartheid is a reality, and I understand, we want to highlight apartheid because there is a legal precedent, and we still, some of us still think that the international legal community, they call them, are going to do anything to help us actually with what we're doing. The truth is, the world supports the Zionist state, not only because of ideological reasons, which sometimes it is the case, not only because the Christian European world feels guilty and ashamed of what they did against their own people in at the turn of the century, but also because there is collision around a whole uh, uh, a complex, a whole industrial complex that is based on war. They need to be at war all the time in order to produce arms, make money, and continue the hegemony of imperialist forces all over the world. So the attack on education should be understood not only, although very important, on the bodies of students and teachers, on our institutions, our buildings, our structures. We cannot bring books into Palestine without paying 
heavy prices. I brought my books, mine, books, mine with me back from the US. I paid taxes and I had to pay uh, two types of uh, whatever it is that they call tariffs or whatever. Uh, my, my friend sent me a box with 10 books. Um, she paid $200 in addition to the shipping expenses. So books are being um, controlled and denied and, and, and managed. And uh, of course, it's, it's no surprise, but I, what I'm encouraging us to think about is also at that level of the production of language and the knowledge being produced, how we are allowed to talk about ourselves. We are not only supposed to not resist. I mean, I think in their mind, we shouldn't even exist. I think some of them really believed the Zionist um, um, uh, mythology of a land without a people. Um, so I think some of them really would like us to not exist. But maybe for some others, since we exist, at least we should exist in particular forms and shapes. So if we resist uh, through arms, they tell us you shouldn't. If we resist through boycott and divestment, they tell us you shouldn't. If we speak about Palestine, they tell us so. I conclude in my mind that yes, at the end of the day, they don't want us to resist. Maybe those of us who will survive physically are supposed to survive in particular forms, maybe something resembling the way the Palestinian Authority currently is uh, serving their interests. And I'm gonna stop here. Thank you, Jamile. There are so many points. You spoke our minds. It's amazing as ever. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And I just want to build on one of the points that you've highlighted in terms of the international community. In fact, the head of UNRWA in Gaza have just said yesterday on an Israeli channel that he thinks the Israeli military strikes in Gaza were sophisticated and precise. Um, and that there's no problem in terms of water, electricity, or food in the Gaza Strip. So you can see here how the narrative of the international community collides with the Israeli narrative and how it's completely out of context and framed completely differently than the experiences of the Palestinians on the ground. And these are the worlds of the representative of a, a UN agency that was created to serve the rights of the Palestinians, including the right of return. So thank you, Jamile. Um, um, we're moving to Ayman from Haifa. Um, Ayman, your presence is with us and participation is very important, particularly to me because you are the, 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 the sign that Palestinians are all together in this, uh, regardless of the fragmentation and all the language that's used that Jamila just highlighted, the fragmentation, geographical fragmentation of Palestinians, Gaza, West Bank, Jerusalem, 48, diaspora. So you being here is that connection. So thank you very much for being here. and can't wait to listen to you. Can't hear you. I said uh, thank you for uh, thank you for you all thank you for the organizers for this opportunity to talk to you and and really if if someone would come from Mars and look at the how the Palestinian lives you know he would say this you know very sophisticated um, regime you know of 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 control and discipline you know through which the lives of the Palestinians uh, 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 are administrated. He would see that there are Palestinians in the exile and there is uh, Palestinians inside uh, uh, Israel, the land of 48, uh, Palestinians in Gaza, Palestinians in the West Territories, A, B, and C. So these are, you know, different regimes, different mechanisms through which the lives of the Palestinians um, is, is, is controlled. It's really, it's really, uh, um, thought-provoking, you know, just to say the least. And uh, just to tell you one story about one article that I, I've tried to, to, to publish, you know, I just put it here on the, everyone. It's, 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 a, it's a kind of a, an engagement whether, you know, how we should look at Israel, whether it's an apartheid, a fascist or, or, or what. You know, what is this regime, you know? How we should approach it even like, uh, uh, now, now we, we can agree that this is a, a, a some type of uh, of, set, uh, of settler uh, uh, 
um, uh, colonialism, but you know, still, you know, is it like an, an apartheid? Is it like a fascist country? And it took me, you know, <laughs> you know how it's hard to publish through international journals. It's, it took me like five rounds of revisions just to insert the word apartheid there. And you know, I, and and you know, ultimately, you know, I I came to just to draw on Israeli politicians themselves, you know, people of, of from from Israel, you know, people like in you know, Ud Barak or the you know people from the army who themselves would describe the uh, Israel as an apartheid, you know, as a, as a, some sort of as a type of you know of an apartheid and and honestly what i have ended up with is like looking at you know you know using uh, uh, this idea of of in philosophy of family resemblance you know you know you have this you know that tennis and 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 football and cricket they are all ball games you know you, these are games with ball with that you play with a ball so these are like ball games like Vin, Vintingston, you know idea of uh, of family resemblance and i said you know i don't know is it an apartheid of our fascist but i know that it it belonged to this unhappy family of apartheid states and fascist states this is what i have you know even to say theoretically about how we how we approach the 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 the, the, the idea the Israel as a, as a political regime. Let me let me just take you into some details about how this settler colonialism works in in education, in 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 in, in the Palestinian education system, in 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 Israel. Uh, one thing is, is the idea of segmentation and segregation. Now, this is one of the of the of the uh, um, uh, mechanisms through this settler colonialism operates. You know, through imposing uh, uh, segregation and segmentation on the Palestinian uh, population. And, and uh, the idea is, uh, first of all, to isolate the Palestinian community from a significant uh, um, um, contact with the with the with the Jewish community on the one hand. And also to 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 divide into the the Palestinian community into sects into into religious groups. So this would be like Jews and 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 Christians and Muslims and Bedouins of the north and Bedouins of the of the of the of the south. You know, so it's really you know working very very hard to. To, to, to impose this mentality, this consciousness of being divided, of, of the idea that you know, this idea of, of being Palestinian is shattered. Uh, and and now, now we can't pretend that this is not working because on the ground, there are also, you know, uh, uh, the political atmosphere is not helping much Palestinians to see, to, 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 to identify themselves as such, you know, to see what is, you know, connecting them as, as a Palestinians, you know, looking at this, you know, like a, a, a division between, you know, like Gaza and the West Bank, Hamas and Fatah, looking at this, you know, talking about, you know, this Oslo Accords, you know, you know, uh, stipulating actually that the Palestinians in Israel doesn't have any political future with the rest of the Palestinian people. I mean, this is the, the idea of, of, uh, of Oslo, you know, actually, you know, uh, uh, um, giving a post, you know, a backwind to this idea that there are particularities. Okay, that there are every group has its own distinct features, distinct, you know, uh, uh, circumstances, and eventually this would help, you know, I don't know, help, you know, this is not the world, but you know, this would create different affiliations, different, you know, group identifications and this we and um, honestly we are fighting it very hard to convince people you know to to educate for this palestinian uh, consciousness for this palestinian identity for this palestinian collective identity against this idea of of divisions all the time 
Now, uh, 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 and there is a very systematic, you know, uh, uh, endeavor to to not not only to unrecognize the Palestinian narrative and the Palestinian uh, 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 um, uh, historiography through the textbooks and the, through the the history, but also and what is is the idea of misrecognition. What is worse than unrecognition is misrecognition. And what do I mean by misrecognition? Misrecognition, it is the idea of, you know, constructing this uh, identity of being an Israeli Arab or an Arab Israeli. Now, this idea, this, this, this identity is augmented, is strengthened through the textbooks through educational practices, through even this neoliberal, you know, uh, 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 policies that you know would uh, would 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 encourage the uh, uh, Palestinian educators not even to think about collective identity, but rather to think about achievement, about you know individual uh, 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 and individual success, uh, individual salvation individual and it's it's really you, you know neoliberalism is about aggressive individualism it's a it's an assault in any form of collectiveness so we end up with palestinian educators struggling with uh, 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 with the meaning of being a palestinian what does it mean to be a palestinian and to live in an in a state that it define itself as a Jewish state, as a state for the Jews, only for the Jews, exclusively for the Jews. So what does it mean to be a Palestinian? It's very hard to educate to be a Palestinian. Now, we, we see all this, you know, now with the Intifada and with the, with the, with the, with the, with the, with the terrible, you know, terrorist attack on Gaza, you know. Uh, so people are um, now aroused, you know, with emotions, with, with, with anger. But, you know, in 10 days, one month, they will go back to the same schools, to the same curricula, to the same textbooks. And honestly, we are, as a Palestinians, we didn't do enough. We don't have, even until now, a curriculum on the Nakba, for example, you know. What, we, what do we expect for a fifth grade or a 10th grade or an eighth grade to learn about Nakba? I'm not talking about history books that would narrate, tells the, the, the story of the Nakba, okay? Now we have, we, have, we, have, we have Palestinian, you know, historians, you know, we have written about it, but I'm talking about a curriculum, something that is really targeting a fifth grade or a tenth grade or eleventh that have a rational, a pedagogical rational. We didn't do enough as as resistance. Resistance is not only a word that we wanna just you know raise it. We wanna do this on the ground with our teachers, with our kids, and as I said, the political atmospheres atmosphere between the Palestinians themselves. This fragmentation is not, is, is not helping. It's not, it's not, it's not giving us, you know, like a, a hope that a, 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 a different future is, is possible. So this, 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 is, this is only when I'm talking about segregation and segmentation. The second thing is this idea of dependency. This is the second mechanism, creating dependency. Whatever you need, you are dependent on the resources that the colonizer would let you, would, would, would make it available for you. You don't, you can't create your own jobs. You don't have uh, an, in the, you, you don't have any form of cultural autonomy or educational autonomy or the, the, the capacities for self-steering education uh, is really minimized, dimensioned. So you are all the time in a state 
of being subaltern, you know, if, if may I use the idea of, you know, being subaltern. You can't even talk, you, you are all the time kept as an inferior, as dependent on the resources. And now this would create, you know, a, 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 a group of middlemen, of brokers, of Palestinian brokers, you know, this is what they do, you know, they all the time they want to negotiate between the Palestinians and the Israelis, they give back, back and forth, give and take. And this creates and there, they become a very important, these are the, the ILB, the important local people, you know, because they are the, the these are the people who could give and take, they could negotiate. And their importance is not because they are important for their people, but because they know how to get things, you know, within the Israeli system. And these are, you know, it's a, it's a, this is the new Mukhtar, you know, if I may call them, you know, it's like the, the new chiefs, you know, the new, you know, this could be in the Israeli parliament, uh, this could be politicians, this could be uh, supervisors, and this is a huge, you know, group of people who are working as, you know, as, as brokers, as, as, as middlemen between the, 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 the two groups. The, the, third, the third strategy is co-optation, to co-optate you. Now, if Ayman is, is very critical, so let's give him a job. Let's take him inside. And believe me, it's very difficult to, to, to talk from inside. You need a voice. Now, many of our politicians, many of, uh, of our Palestinian, you know, intellectuals, <clears throat> one way or another, you know, they speak from the from institutions. Today, I asked. Uh, the organizers not to be not to be presented as affiliated with the Haifa University, you know, because I'm I'm the chair of the of this research uh, 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 committee, which is like a in, in Mada El Carmel, which is like a Palestinian civil society organization. You know, we work you know on our issues to empower our our community, but ultimately we have jobs. We, we live inside, you know, and this is the very complicated relationships between colonized and colonizers. Haider talked about Franz Fanon, you know, and, 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 and we remember, you know, and, and Paulo Freire and, you know, this, this very complicated, intangible, you know, relationship where you also, you know, you are part of, you are, you are, you are engaged on daily, on daily basis with the students, with Jewish students, with Jewish, a, a medical staff, what, whatever. You go to their homes, you go to their streets, you, you, you think about, you know, how many generations it would take them to indigenize. I can't really build on the idea that I am the indigenous. I see this indigeneity is dissolving. They are attaching, they are building their own place identity. Now I need to think about that. How many generations they need to feel indigenous? indigenous? I don't know. I'm, 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 I'm talking out of really, of, of this complexity, you know, in settler colonial societies, it's not just about haves and haves not, uppers and lowers, you know, uh, these dichotomies do not work anymore. So this idea of co-optation. Now what's happening now, and maybe this would be one of my final uh, remarks, is this idea of religious ethno-nationalism. What characterizes Israel right now is this ethos of religious ethno-nationalism. Now ethnos, uh, uh, religious, uh, 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 ethnos, uh, uh, um, it is a very particular form of ethno-nationalism. It is not, you know, we, we know what ethno-nationalism is, but this one is, is, is more, I would say, it's a, it's a, it, it builds on a, on a transcendent ideals, 
that you know th that you know gives this idea of Jewish superiority uh, as a, a seal of sanctity, of inevitability, of of uh, of sacredness. So for them, this is uh, it is uh, they are convinced that you know that they are the uh, the uh, Eva Illused called the settlers as, as a kind of uh, a new slavery movement because slavery is not is not only about you know trafficking people it's it's about domination it's about you know interrupting the lives of people anytime violently what wherever what whenever you want and this is the the idea of zionism it's not anymore to occupy the land it is about to occupy the life of the Palestinians to defeat him within his home, within his you know uh, uh, field, within his factory, home place is to defeat him from within. And now this is what they are you know trying to 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 accomplish, uh, 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 and 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 we are resisting, and. And, and they keep feeding this idea of Zionism with this religious ethno nationalism, you know, that, you know, it is about salvation, it's about redemption, it's about, you know, a messianic idea of the, of the land of Israel, it's not anymore the state of Israel, it's the land of Israel. And honestly, what I see now that for them, the issue of the West Bank is not anymore. There are a consensus in Israel about settling in the in the west in the west bank it's a it's a it's a consensus in in, in israeli politics you know the idea that they want to annex annex the uh, 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 zone c it's it's a kind of a consensus what does it mean now to be a right in israel is to be anonymous is to be hostile to the palestinians inside israel this is what now defines being right in Israel. The more you, now, to what extent you are on the right and on the right, now there is a scale of being on the right in Israel. I mean, the right, you know, I don't wanna, uh, don't, you know, uh, I'm using now the Israeli terms for it, right? But it's, uh, uh, but you know, the, to what extent you are extreme, the extreme right, you know, it is the extent you are now showing aggression and hostility to the Palestinians inside Israel. Because there is an agreement that, you know, as, as it concerns the Palestinians inside the, the West Bank, you know, there, there's an agreement. We wanted this all for us. And maybe to keep these cantons and, and ghettos. So what I have tried to do is to show you a little bit about these ideas of a, a, a segmentation and segregation this idea of uh, co-optation, this idea of dependency, and ultimately this would affect four major issues. The quality of the education provided to the Palestinians. Now, all indicators, you can see that the quality of education provided to the Palestinians inside Israel is uh, a third world, you know, uh, 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 education. You know, if you go to the results in Pisa, in Beers, in the Thames, in mathematics, and all this, you know, international service, you know, the, and you and you see how the Jewish pupils and how the Palestinian pupils are performing. You would see a huge gap between both. Israeli uh, uh, academics would describe this: the Jews are in the first world, the Arabs in the third world. You know, this is this is a huge gap in terms of the quality of the education when it comes to the. To the to the uh, 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 equality, huge gaps. But you know, when it comes to 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 the resources allocated to the uh, to uh, 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 to the Palestinians and Jewish uh, uh, kids, if you compare the two groups, you know, sometimes you would see that a Jewish kid is invested twice as much as an Arab kid in the high schools. Uh, so this is when it comes to the equity in terms of the equality and the and the allocation of resources. When it comes to recognition, I've been talking about this. You know, this the idea of de-Palestinizing. De it's not just you know unrecognized; it's to de-Palestinize them. And uh, uh, the last thing is power sharing. You know, you are all the time consuming policies, 
consuming decisions. You have never a, a, a seat on the table to decide what is the best for your kids, what is the best for your school. So if you look at these major areas of equality, quality, and participations and the idea of like a power sharing, you know, that I wanna, this is concerns my life, you know, you uh, and, and recognitions and all indicators, you are marginalized, you are disempowered and you are colonized. Let me stop here and maybe uh, I can elaborate more in the Thank Q &A. you. Thank you very much, Ayman. So much, so much to say about this. And, and it's very good because people don't realize that they're actually Palestinians behind the green line. And, and, and they're completely worldwide. When they talk about Palestinians, people look at Gaza and the West Bank, sometimes Jerusalem, but Palestinians in 48 behind the green line, they're completely, even internationally, not seen. So thank you for bringing that to light. I'll share the last uh, presentation, which is Professor Mario Novelli, who talks about solidarity between people, particularly in Colombia and the people in Palestine within the framework of education. And it's a, it's a very emotional presentation. I really loved it and I hope you'll enjoy it as well. So I'll just share my screen. Um, okay. The last weeks have seen two peoples, two places that have a very special place in my heart and my soul, have witnessed some monumental events, both beautiful and painful in equal measure. In Palestine, we have seen an unprecedented resistance against Israeli state oppression, not only in Gaza and the occupied territories, but also amongst post-48 Palestinians living in Israel. Resistance that was truly his historic and heroic against a militarized Israeli state that would stop at nothing to destroy that unity of purpose and that dignity in resistance. That was the beauty but the pain has also been incredibly powerful. At least 248 Palestinians killed, many children included, thousands injured, and now in the aftermath of the ceasefire, mass arrests are taking place across Israel. In Colombia, sparked by a national strike against a highly regressive new tax law, millions of Colombians rose up from April 28th across the country, uh, and continue to struggle with ongoing blockades and mobilizations, particularly in Colombia's second city, Cali. This has likewise led to massive pain and oppression. Over 40 deaths, hundreds arrested and injured by police and military, and many people disappeared. My friend, ex-union leader, and now a member of the Colombian Senate, Alexander Lopez Maya, has been forced to flee into temporary exile after his partner received a telephone call threatening that they would kill him, her, and the children, and providing harrowing details of their knowledge of where they lived, where the kids studied, and where his partner worked. I don't have time to go into any more detail about the background to both struggles, but would point you towards two impressive pieces in English that I've appreciated over the last few days. The first, a piece by Andy Higginbottom, on the roots of the Colombian crisis, and the second by Omar Barghouti on Palestine and the BDS campaign. Both Palestinians and the Colombian people sit on the wrong side of dominant geopolitics. Both the Israeli and Colombian state are armed and funded to the hilt by the United States of America and their Western allies, including the UK, and prefer to turn a blind eye to oppressive state terrorism carried out in both contexts. Big Western geopolitical and financial interests outtrump human rights as they turn a blind eye to both Israeli apartheid policies and the Colombian elite state and parastate violence against social movements, the poor and the marginalized. But again, we have also seen the beauty of international people to people solidarity, stronger in both cases than ever before, which at least gives us some hope for me, the most inspiring thing of the last weeks has been seeing so many young people mobilize in Colombia, 
in Palestine and in solidarity marches around the world. It is those youth that hold the key to success and we need to challenge the demonization of those youth who are not a demographic time bomb, a threat, a danger, but in fact they are the hope for a better, more just future for all of us. In my short intervention, I want to address the issue of education and its relationship to the struggle for freedom in Palestine and Colombia. Firstly, I want to reflect on the field of international development and education, of which many of us engage in. Secondly, I want to reflect on education's relationship to the conflicts in Palestine and Colombia. And thirdly, I want to make a number of suggestions of what we, as educators, academics, students around the world, can do to support the struggles of Colombians and Palestinians in this epochal moment. Firstly, many of us online today and the organisers of this event work in the area of international development and education with a particular focus on the relationship between education, conflict, war and peace. Research in our field of study is heavily dependent on international donors, large international agencies and Western philanthropic organisations. For that reason, it often suffers from some research blind spots, particularly related to those contexts where its allies are involved and engaged in serious human rights abuses, whether that be the denial of the right to education, the systematic targeting of teachers and students or the destruction or occupation of schools, universities and educational establishments. While it's fine to talk and research about the Taliban or Islamic State, Boko Haram, etc., there is often a deafening silence when it comes to Israel's attacks on Palestinian students, teachers, academics and Palestinian education in general. Similarly, Despite regular killings, harassment and attacks by state and parastate forces in Colombia of students, teachers and academics, the international community seems fixated on attacking and critiquing its neighbour, Venezuela. The hypocrisy is blatantly evident. In both of these cases, it has been up to global social movements and global trade unions to raise awareness. The micropolitics of how this process happens is worthy of research, but I just want to give an example of my own experience in that. Back in 2010, I attended the launch of the Education Under Attack report at UNESCO, Paris, a global report that documented violence against education communities and systems around the world. At the launch, the lead author gave an overview of the report to UNESCO country representatives. And while neither Colombia and Israel were signalled as being the worst perpetrators of human rights violations, these two country representatives were without doubt the most vocal, the most angry and fierce in their rebuttals of the evidence presented. Within a few days, the report was pulled off the UNESCO website and reverberations were felt across the international development and education community. Whatever lobbying and pressure went on behind closed doors, it had its effect and UNESCO later ceased its involvement in the global report, which later moved to Human Rights Watch in the USA, where it remains. There are many more examples of the research and practice based activities and UK Palestinian partnerships are severely restricted. Of course, all this bias and blindness is reflected in the way the media coverage has gone over recent weeks, particularly on the Palestine-Israeli conflict, but also to a lesser degree in Colombia. The above reflects how selectively Western governments interpret worthy and unworthy victims. In this I often turn to Judith Butler, who notes that one way of posing the question of who we are in these times of war is by asking whose lives are considered valuable, whose lives are mourned and whose lives are considered ungrievable. We might think of war as dividing populations into those who are grievable and those who are not. An ungrievable life is one that cannot be mourned because it has never lived. That is, it has never counted as a life at all. We can see the division of the globe into grievable and ungrievable lives from the perspective of those who wage war in order to defend the lives of certain communities and to defend them against the lives of others, even if it means taking those latter lives. Secondly, and relatedly, 
if we recognize the above, then we should be amplifying our voices to make the case for education research on and educational programs with those unworthy victims of contemporary Western geopolitical priorities. For there is so much to say and so much to learn. Education matters to both Palestinians and Colombians, and we need to know more and research more and advocate more for the right of all Palestinians and Colombians to access good quality education, an education that is equitably funded and supported, that is relevant to their needs, that respects their identities, their histories and their struggles. There is much that we can do to ensure that the plight of Colombians and Palestinians is known about in our classes, is lobbied for, is researched and is widely heard. Thirdly, I just want to reflect on what Omar Barghouti calls meaningful solidarity. Clearly, today is part of that process. But we need to think of more ways that we can ensure that the issue of Palestine and Colombia is not forgotten. We are undoubtedly fortunate that we sit in institutions of learning, but we need to reclaim these spaces and make them the conscience of our societies. We need to bring the debates and the issues into our campuses and our classrooms and educate a new generation in issues of international solidarity and liberation struggles. We also need to ensure that our institutions are not contributing to the oppression of Colombians and Palestinians through arms, through trade, through investments and through pension funds. We need to build the links between the past and the present and across the different intersectional struggles going on around the world to make social justice for Colombians and Palestinians not just desirable, but inevitable, and to extend that freedom struggle around the world. I know from bitter experiences that standing with the oppressed is never easy, and there are sometimes consequences, but those are nothing compared to the price Palestinians and Colombians are having to pay over many years, and particularly in the last week. Raising the issue of Palestine in the UK has become harder over recent years, and that makes it all the more important to keep raising our voices. In times when I'm feeling weak, I often turn to this paragraph from Edward Said from his BBC Wreath Lectures. Nothing, in my view, is more reprehensible than those habits of mind in the intellectual that induce avoidance, that character. Finally. Sorry, 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 Columbia. sorry. Sorry, my mistake. I know from bitter experiences that standing with the oppressed is never easy and there are sometimes consequences, but those are nothing compared to the price Palestinians and Colombians are having to pay over many years and particularly in the last week. Raising the issue of Palestine in the UK has become harder over recent years and that makes it all the more important to keep raising our voices. In times when I'm feeling weak, I often turn to this paragraph from Edward Said from his BBC Wreath Lectures. Nothing, in my view, is more reprehensible than those habits of mind in the intellectual that induce avoidance, that characteristic turning away from a difficult and principled position, which you know to be the right one, but which you decide not to take. You do not want to appear too political. You're afraid of seeming too controversial. You need the approval of a boss or an authority figure. You want to keep a reputation for being balanced, objective, moderate. Your hope is to be asked back, to consult, to be on a board or prestigious committee, and so to remain within the responsible mainstream. For an intellectual, these habits of mind are corrupting par excellence. If anything can denature, neutralize, and finally kill a passionate intellectual life, it is these considerations internalized, so to speak, in the driver's seat. Finally, from Colombia, I just want to end with a phrase often used, but I'm sure our Palestinian friends will feel strongly empathize with. Para nuestros muertos, ni un minuto de silencio, todo una vida de lucha, which in English roughly translates as for our martyrs, 
not one minute on your hands, but instead a lifetime of struggle. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was all our speakers. Uh, we're running out of time, but I think we have some time for questions. There's a lot to digest and, and think about. Um, and I'm sure we will have more of these sessions, but maybe we can start if anyone has questions. I haven't seen any, seen a lot of comments in the chat, but not questions. So to gender, how do you want to do it? Um. Yeah, thanks, May. Um, maybe if colleagues have some, you know, questions, maybe we could actually take a few questions um, and and very quickly speakers could could respond, if that's okay. You could just raise your hand and uh, you can turn up your turn on your camera and then ask the question. So we got a question from Maria. Hello, uh, thank you for this opportunity. I know uh, Mr. Ferrali from UCL. Um, so um, yeah, I, I did my dissertation for my master's in UCL on the role of UNRWA education for the social integration of Palestinians in Jordan and Lebanon. Um, and I, I just want to ask about, from your experience, from all the speakers actually, I couldn't, uh, because I think all of you have experience, what is the role of UNRWA? In, in all of this thing, because from my research, I, I felt that they do support the Palestinians, but, but of course they have kind of to be kind of diplomatic and not fully support them, you know, like or too, too obviously. Do, do you understand what I mean? So, but I feel that actually they, they do want to support the Palestinian identity um, but they, they have also to be diplomatic with, you know, the United States or with Israel. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks I, very much, Maria. Should we take more or? Yeah, I think if there are a couple of other questions, we could take them now. Um, I can't people are typing now. questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah, there's been a lot of uh, very interesting discussion going on in the chat. Um, so if colleagues are still around, please do uh, raise your hand and uh, just fire away your questions. There's a question that um, links to what Jamila was saying as well as, um, as well as what Mario said at the end that I would like to highlight in the chat. Um, it's how can we in the UK academia resist the fight against the increasing restrictions of freedom of speech and accusations of anti-Semitism? Hmm. That's a, that's a great question. So I was also thinking about asking a similar question, particularly um, to Ayman, uh, you know, how do you create that space for struggle when you are working within the structure that is you know, mainly oppressive to the people that you are fighting for? Um, so where do you find the pockets of hope? So if you could uh, reflect very briefly, <laughs> We don't have a lot of time that would be great so and maybe a very quick 30 seconds final words from uh, from um uh, you know speakers uh, on on other other points as well yeah over to you speakers ayman would you like to go first yeah uh, you need to unmute yeah thank you i think radical humanism to decolonize it also means that I'm attentive to this occupier, to this offender, hopes and fears. Now, I know this is not very nice words to say, but you know, I think that we are obliged as Palestinians to, to, to reclaim humanity, not only ours, but also theirs. And this is part of, you know, but not to give up, not to give up to see their humanity, their fears, their hopes, and to encounter with it, to engage with it seriously and not just with blame politics. So this is one thing. The other thing is to uh, look for 
this, you know, oppositional venues. You know, there are venues, no system is completely and, and, and totally is repressive. There is always places to maneuver, to resist on daily lives. And this is what we have been doing by creating this Palestinian civil society organizations to introduce our narrative, to empower our youth, to, 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 to educate for this idea that you are a Palestinian and belong to the Palestinian uh, 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 people. So in one word is, is this idea of radical humanism I really, I really impress it. And I really think that it is something that we want to, as Palestinians, not giving it up. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, Yamile, you could also reflect on uh, Maria's question about the role of UNRWA education. Yeah. I, I will in a second. I just wanted to also talk about Pockets of Hope. I come from the perspective of, um, I, my friends tell me I am a hopeless, a helpless case because I am always hopeful, regardless. I always look for those pockets of hope. And when I don't find them, we create them. We make them up. We crack the system, we create cracks. And, and two things I wanna add uh, to what uh, Ayman, you said, uh, I love it, I wrote it down. Uh, I also wanna add to it two things is, um, actually, we are full of hope. They're the ones that should worry about that. We are in our land, in our ancestors' land. Our ancestors talk to us. Our young people talk to us. They're the ones that should be asking themselves that question. I know for a fact they do not have hope. I know for a fact that the thief is always worried that what they stole is going to be taken away from them. And we know who is the indigenous of this land. Indigenous people don't uproot their trees, the occupier does. Indigenous people don't destroy the land, the occupier does. If it was theirs to start with, they wouldn't need to steal it. So in some ways for us, our hope is part of our existence. That's the only way we know how to be. And again, since uh, Ayman, you, were, you reminded me of Paulo Freire. Freire talks about our need to be patiently impatient. And that's how I think of us as Palestinians. And this latest round, I mean, come on. When we say from the river to the sea, we actually saw it. They saw it, they know that 80 years of Zionist plans and work and money and oppression did not work because Palestine rose as one. When they attacked Jerusalem, we in the Gaza and West Bank could not make our way physically to Jerusalem. Our families that could physically come tried. They tried to stop them and we turned it around. They now know everything Ayman you were saying, this moment, I'm not claiming that it's sustainable and I'm not saying that it's, we, we, we win the war, but this moment is extremely, extremely important that after all the might, all the power, all the work, that academic institutions, their army, the, the, uh, the governments around the world supporting them. And after almost a century, last week, they, should have seen very clearly that we are one people, we are one country. And no, they're not gonna divide us. So that gives me hope. That, that is where it comes from. In terms of UNRWA, Maria, I would love to read your research, by the way. I've always been curious about them. Um, it, yeah, I mean, I bet they say that they have to do this and they have to do that. UNRWA is, um, um, in, in my mind, in my view, the way I see UNRWA, uh, it is an extension of the UN. It's, it's a UN institution. And the UN to start with was one of the main reasons why we are in this trouble. They divided our country. So like for me to start with UN resolutions or anything UN for me is suspect. They need to prove to me that I shouldn't suspect them. I don't trust them. Honorable in particular, um, Part of the role it does is actually to pacify um, our refugees, is to keep us in our place, is to provide, and this is not something that I'm making up. You read the, the reports of UNRWA, you read their appeals, look at how they raise money. Look at the letters that they send 
to raise money from governments and from other uh, uh, sources in the world. The language is basically saying, if you don't give us money, these people are gonna revolt and they're gonna turn everything upside down. So no, UNRWA is not here to help us. UNRWA's role is a little bit more like the good cop, bad cop. They don't use uh, arms to keep us in place, but they use education. Now, this is not to say that the services they provide are not important. These are extremely important. I mean, for Palestinian refugees, um, that's the only way that uh, they have access to schooling, to some sort of health, some sort of assistance. I'm not denying that. I'm not saying it's not important. But we need to look at the big picture. Charity can be extremely dangerous for the people fighting for liberation. And what this guy in Gaza said and did, this should not come as a surprise. This has been more the norm than not, except quite often what the honorable officials have to say, they say it in internal reports that they send to governments and funders. And unless you are a scholar with access to all of that internal uh, stuff, you can very easily. What I would say is, um, it might help you to see how Palestinians spoke about UNRWA in the 60s and 70s, particularly how Hassan Kanafani spoke and wrote about them. That will give you a good idea. It's no coincidence that UNRWA always has people on the top that are not Palestinian. If UNRWA was really here for us, about us, we would be running it, we would be leading it. But they always have the whitest, most colonialist people in positions of power. And then there's always really, really, really good people doing amazing work on the ground. But as an institution, I don't trust. Mm. I think the neutrality policy is a representation of, of that kind of you know, taming of Palestinians, particularly with an education, Jamile. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, excuse me, but can I add something about um, Maria's question about UNRWA and so on? Um, it's um, very, very fast. So um, UNRWA as an inter international organization, it is supposed to provide health, educational, and other kinds of assistance for refugees. So it's there for refugees only, as it's there in every part of the world. It's not there for Palestinians. For example, there are um, UNRWA in Syria, Jordan, and so on. However, in um, the last 10 genocide that was happening in Gaza, Israel simply informed UNRWA and UNICEF that they are going to bomb two schools. And it's happened. So imagine this, an international organization that is supposed to protect individuals is simply being bombed. And also different schools were actually bombed um, in the last uh, four aggressions in, um, um, in Gaza. Um, one more thing, I, I studied, I'm, I'm from Gaza, I studied in UNRWA schools and I always wondered, so um, UNRWA, they usually provide books for students, but there's one book that we have to buy. UNRWA, they don't give it for us. And that book is basically, uh, we call it national education. So it teaches us about the history of Palestine. So they don't provide that book for us. We have to buy it and, and receive, um, you know, the education from other teachers. Uh, one more thing. Um, UNRWA itself can't actually, um, let's say, um, from, from my experience in Gaza, I have a friend who was working as a teacher in UNRWA, and usually UNRWA, um, they uh, provide teaching um, or training sessions for their teachers, whether it's outside of Gaza or outside of Palestine. Of course, they have to apply for permits by the Israeli government. If these permits are rejected, UNRWA can do anything. So simply teachers will remain in the West Bank or in Gaza, and they will not, will not be able to receive their um, educational uh, training and so on. So UNRWA is being crippled by the Israeli government and they are not doing anything. Israel is above the international law, despite the fact that it's supposed to be UNRWA who's helping and so on, but they are not doing the same job that they are supposed to be doing it. I'm sorry if I took too long. No, but yeah, thank you, uh, Tanim. That was that was um, very helpful and very informative, um, I think. Um, um, so I'm afraid we are running out of time. Uh, I think this has been a great event, uh, very um, powerful interventions from our speakers. And uh, we would definitely like to have more time to, to engage in, in debate and discussions around these 
very pertinent issues and uh, our hearts and support and solidarity go to the educational uh, you know, community uh, who are really sort of suffering because of this brutal war. Um, and uh, as unfortunately we haven't had uh, Dr. Um, Heather Eid and Professor Mario Novelli uh, in person today, but their contributions were uh, really powerful. And uh, at some point in the future, we would have an opportunity to reconvene and, and have more interactions with them. And I would definitely like to um, thank Dr. Yamila Hussein Shanan and Dr. Um, Ayman um, Agbairia for very um, uh, powerful messages and the passion that you both showed uh, you know, for the importance of struggle, uh, the importance of uh, uh, coming together uh, and, and continuing the struggle, um, uh, the, the, the message that you've shared. And, and I hope that many of our participants today would share uh, similar views um, that we should have more of these events uh, because uh, if we don't speak for the most oppressed people, then what is the significance of uh, being human, uh, if, if, you, if you like. I think the, the message that Edward Said's quote Mario shared at the end is quite powerful, that um, I think it certainly gives uh, strength to all of us that we should always remind ourselves with those, uh, those views. So um, we would like to thank both of you, um, Ayman and Yasmina, for, for your time and from you know, connecting from very difficult place uh, that you are in. And we're most grateful for your contribution to the seminar series. Um, and uh, we hope to be in touch in the future. Uh, and thanks everyone, uh, everyone, I mean everyone, for joining uh, this uh, webinar today and, and listening to us. And we hope to be in touch again very soon. Thank you. Uh, just before we close, I shared a call from Birzeit University, um, who they um, they issued today, and there are three main points that the academic community can do uh, in terms of boycott, in terms of supporting Palestinian academics. Supporting one of the questions was about the attack against academics, either Palestinians or allies who talk about Palestine, whether it be in the UK, in the US or globally. So please do take a look at the call and see what the actions are and, and, and do get engaged with the call. Uh, that would be much appreciated. And um, I think there's a lot to talk about. So maybe to gender, it's our task to, um, to organize some of more of these webinars. Thank you so much. That was really, really great. Um, thank you very much, Ayman. Yeah. Thank you, Jamile. Lots of love. Thank you. And see you soon again. See you soon. Bye. Bye.